Well, following this lovely introduction, I have a huge advantage as moderator. I don't have to do the introduction myself. That's fantastic. Congratulations. It's a very important topic that we're going to be talking about now, and I think it will be the mega topic for the next decade the end of the unipolar world system, that's what it's been referred to as, and the graphs tended to say that both regions, the United States and China, are competing. Well, that would be nice, I think. The race is characterized by the fact that both are trying to run fast and to be the first to arrive at the finish line. And this sets off a certain amount of positive momentum. And it could very well be that the fight for hegemony in the world is going to be a type of martial art where Let's, let's talk about boxers who got together. Both are less well off than beforehand, even if one won. And then, of course, the picture is not quite that good. But to study this, that's what we're going to do during this panel discussion this afternoon. We'll be discussing this in more detail with experts who are responsible for various areas in this race, if I can put it in such neutral terms. terms. So what's interesting about all of this race is that we're moving along all sorts of different dimensions. It's not only an economic race or economic competition who's growing faster. It's also competition for innovation and perhaps also a military or geopolitical competition. And it could also be a competition or race which will show other things as well. Financial market institutions, for instance. And I think who who has the reserve currency, etc. And fortunately, we have four people here today who can cover all of these points. So let me introduce the panel. First of all, to my right, on the very far right, is Professor Gabriel Felbermeyer, President of the Institute for the World Economy at the Kiel University. Then we have to my right-hand side, Monika Schnitzer, Professor Schnitzer, who has already been introduced. I'd still like to note and add one more thing. Why is she in this very important position? She was a member of the institution in Germany that was responsible for advising the German government on innovation. And she then resigned from this position when she became a member of one of the economic wise men for overall economic development. It's a very hard job, but you are a real expert, and we look forward to that. And then to my left, we have Dr. Pittig, Dr. Peter Wittig. He's had a long career in the field of practical foreign affairs. He was ambassador in London, in Washington for Germany, and he is now, he's changed sides, so to speak. He's now head of global affairs at Scheffler. And then to my left, Dr. Wolfgang Fink, he is he covers financial market institutions, financial markets. You might I think we have an ideal person here as a CEO of Goldman Sachs in Europe. So now I've sort of outlined the structure for our panel discussion. And what I'd like to do is to ask all four of you basically the same question. What do you think of this race, this competition, based on the different dimensions you cover? What do you expect? How do you think it's going to take place? positive, negative? Is it going to be more like a sprint or more like a boxing match? And then in the second round or maybe in the second part we could go into more detail as to what this means for Europe. So what 
would what recommendation would you give to the European Union or its member states when it comes to this race and this fight for power? How should Europe position itself? And I'd also like to begin with Gabriel Felbermayr. He has been active in the public and talked about the free trade agreement. And I believe that you are now outed for TTIP. And then on the other hand, you also said that the trade relations with China should not be neglected. We shouldn't give them up with the U.S., of course. Now, it sounds to a certain extent like, how are we going to go about this? How should I understand all of this? Well, thank you very much. The question fits in quite nicely to the second question. What should we do in Europe as a result of the situation we're in? But before I go into that, I'd also like to talk about how this competition will end. Where will it take us? I think we all agree. So we do this at Kiel or at the World Bank, long-term forecasts. And of course, as Clayman said, China will continue to move ahead. Also, if you calculate this in dollars, purchase powering, purchasing power is just artificial. So China will run after the US. And of course, all of the long-term forecasts tell us that China has a bad demography. And in the 2040s, we will see that we will have a big China. And we will see that China will be the largest economy way ahead of the United States and Europe. So in other words, if you want to talk about boxing sports and economic size, who's going to be the winner? Well. I think it's almost unavoidable. It's going to be China. But I think our boxing analogy doesn't take it quite that far, because there are two who are in the boxing ring. And I think the different members of the WHO and the EU, in the EU and I think that we can indeed imagine more than just having two boxers in the boxers ring. And then we can see the Western countries as a type of club, countries that have similar moral values, similar economic systems. And I think that when we talk about the transatlantic area, China will be greater than or larger than the US and also larger than Europe. If the EU and the US work together, that's what the forecasts tell us, then together they will be more. They will have more economic power to bring in than China might have in 2040, 2045. And then together we will be on a par, which we will not have if we don't cooperate. That's why when TTIP was being discussed in 2013 to 2015 or 16, I thought to myself it was clear, to me anyway, that geostrategically it is something that we need without being told what to do on everything by the United States and without also doing everything that Washington says. No, also vis-a-vis -vis China, we wanted to be on par, on a par with them and, and to be able to move or deviate from that. So when we talk about our strategy, then it must include working together with the United States in order to be on a par with the Chinese when we have our discussions. So this, of course, takes us to the question that you asked. What can we do here in Europe? TTIP, you mentioned that. This is something we don't talk about anymore. These four letters are no longer used. And that's why I think that the situation we have today is better when it comes to promoting transatlantic cooperation. It's not only a question of trade barriers and reducing trade barriers. It's a question now, 
and it's become much clearer in a much larger relationship that we want to and we must have transatlantic cooperation for climate protection, the Climate Club, this is also transatlantic. And I also believe that we have to talk about the UK and Canada, which are now somewhere in between the US and the EU when we talk about transatlantic cooperation. We also have to say that this all fits in. If we only see, say, TTIP and the EU27, then of course the group would be smaller than it could be. That's what I have to say on that point. Thank you. Are there any direct responses to that? So I think we should uh, seize this opportunity. If not, okay, then I continue. And this is the next question. There is uh, this innovation competition, the pressure for innovation in both countries. Looking at the statistics and the publications coming from China and looking at them, for instance, it's quite, uh, say, devastating how many there are and how important they are. So some of my students writing a doctoral thesis say they are just copying things, they cannot think in innovative terms. And, you know, today I believe that we have to uh, throw overboard this way of thinking because at present, and the figures might not demonstrate all this, but I do not want to anticipate an answer. What about competition in uh, the fields of competition patterns? Is it good or is it bad? You know, on the one hand, we've got the decoupling. I think, you know, it would be nice if both are starting and increasing their number of innovations. This is what we just heard. You know, what about it? What do you think? Well, you mentioned that before. I was in the Commission for Research and Innovation. We went to China on two occasions, and 10 years ago, the first time, we had the impression that they're copying things, and our companies that go here should make sure that they don't let everything be copied. They developed some strategies to prevent that from happening, and we came back in the belief that they are not really all that innovative. They are not even trained to be so. But now we have noticed, of course, they're innovative. Not only do they have a lot of patents, but they also develop high quality patents and they also are catching up. What are we doing? We're not catching up. If you take a look at artificial and uh, intelligence, you'll see that we in Germany, 15 years ago, we had 6% of the patents worldwide. Five years ago, we were at 3%. So, okay, well, that's because China has caught up. But the United States, at the same period of time, kept the same amount. So they did something better than we did. So we have to ask, why don't we manage this? And where do we need to improve? And this, in my opinion, is also due to the fact that these topics, such as digitization in Germany, have not been given enough attention. We were much too late when it came to dealing with these questions and schools, for example. We all know, and we heard from heard about an, from an artist, I believe a pianist, said if you want to be a pianist, then you have to start very, very early. Otherwise, you'll never be a world-renowned pianist. And the same applies to information technology. If I want to be a great IT expert, then I have to begin very early. We have examples from the U.S. that show us they begin in primary school and grammar school, not just later on. We didn't take any of this seriously enough, and even there was resistance to having more of this in the school, so I think we're damaging ourselves. And then you can come back to the example we heard before. Would we win if our companies were to merge why aren't we able to have a high-speed train and how can we, why can't we succeed in China? Well, I think you can forget about that. They're doing it themselves now. And I don't think it's due because we didn't allow for a certain merger. Well, what's the reason? Maybe we didn't expand things enough. Maybe we don't have enough political support. Maybe we're too much against all of this. These are things that we need to deal with because at the end of the day, it's also a question of the companies themselves and also the underlying conditions. And I think that these need to be improved so that things will be successful. And at this point, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and say, it's high time. Otherwise, we will be steamrollered. 
Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hope everyone listened because there are a number of people here who are, say, leading and operating innovative companies. And I hope they heard this message. But these people who are here, I'm sure that they are doing this anyway. All right, we can now continue and uh, would like to introduce the geostrategic aspect. In this con uh, context, the constructive element of this competition hasn't developed uh, far enough. Looking or talking about geostrategy, we think of brutal instruments of competition, including military conflicts. You know, yesterday we discussed this uh, to some extent, you know, the confrontations uh, and the Thucydides uh, trap, etc., etc. So how do you see this? You see, you observe the American and uh, the European policies for many years. How serious is it? You know, the threat that we might, you know, get ensnared in this kind of trap, you know, a trap meaning this kind of conflict. Yes, you touched on that already. The relationship between the United States and China is a kind of strategic axis around which the international system is rotating or will rotate, that is, the international order will be rotating around this axis over the next decades, maybe over many decades of this century. And the big question in this respect is, now, will this be an antagonistic development or will there be some kind of cooperative development? Is it possible to have this kind of cooperative development between these two world powers? And I believe the, 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 the future is still really open in this respect. It is certainly not, say, um, forecast or predicted. So looking at it, the impression is that there are two trains, you know, racing against each other and the antagonistic elements uh, of the increased China, you know, aspires to become the world power number one, not only in economic terms, but also in geopolitical terms. Behind this is the Chinese understanding to become the center of the world, the Middle Kingdom, as they say, you should be the center of the world. This is very, uh, very, say, deeply rooted in their mind, and this also reflects the time schedule they have developed in the United States and surely there's some kind of consensus in Washington and the United States surely want to stop this rise of China. They want to prevent it or delay it, you know, uh, delay China uh, de delay China from becoming the number one and the dominance in geopolicies. So, and they also see a kind of system competition and in this context, they want to, you know, uh, make them the runner-up. So when it comes to exporting the respective systems, so they want them to be number two. Okay, so this uh, is a kind of antagonistic approach uh, when looking at the situation. Of course, uh, one question arises immediately. Where is Europe? What's Europe's position? And here I would like to agree with Mr. Wintermeyer, because on the one hand, we do not have an option, an option for equidistance. So we cannot say we can try to position ourselves in the middle between the two, muddle our way through just in the middle, you know, there is a danger that we are get caught in, say, the grinding, the two grinding stones, and this also means that we're going to face some losses. But we have to, say, get together with the United States. This is a kind of transatlantic moment, you might say. But, and uh, you might say that this uh, Cold War mood, uh, which is prevalent in the United States, we should not get trapped into this or ensnared in this, you know. Antagonistic direction, this is the train, uh, this is the direction of the train. But for us, this is not an option. So, looking at uh, the situation as a whole, we have to navigate between the two. Now, we have to think of our own uh, European strengths. We are not a world power, but we are a world trading power. 
And, you know, when it comes to setting, defining standards, so then we are, you say, world leader. And if we do things together with the United States without getting ensnared in a, in a, in a, in a, in a conflict, uh, then I think I see a chance that we'll be able to, you know, see things in a more nuanced way, you know, looking at China. Climate protection, for instance, economic rivals, yes, we will be, and competitors, you know, you know, uh, competing for the best innovations, and uh, surely we will also become genuine rivals, maybe even opponents, adversaries, particularly when looking at Taiwan. Uh, this is what the United States see. But I believe that we have to calibrate things. We should not be adversary only, only but we should also be partners. Now, just to follow up on this, uh, what about the danger of, uh, say, coincidental or, an, or, an, or an, you know, an incidence which will then escalate into a military conflict, a conflict which nobody really wants? I think uh, the, the, the hottest thing here is Taiwan. I think that this is what most people knowing China should say. President Xi well said and clearly said it and promised to the Chinese population to bring Taiwan home, as they say. You know, the United States, uh, Taiwan is not a member of the NATO, of NATO but nevertheless, you know, we uh, promise support, military support, and they will fight you know, the law of sea, the international uh, legal system, which is, you know, an which is vital also in economic terms, we want to maintain and preserve this situation, this status. And uh, there might be misinterpretations of, uh, you know, the respective fighting parties. I do not really expect a war over the next few years, but you have to, you know, say, think of it, keep it in mind that this wish on the part of China to bring Taiwan home is certainly something which will not simply disappear into thin air and this uh, will really mean a conflict in one or the other way, hopefully not a military conflict. So that brings me to the area that I'm most interested in personally, not only because I know the least about it, and you can read a lot about trade agreements, innovation, military conflicts in the press, but you don't see anything about the confrontation between the U.S. and China with respect to the global financial system. And the global financial system is just as important as the economy itself. So I think it's at least as much responsible or as responsible for as many crises as the economy itself. So now my question or the questions that I have are, why don't we hear anything about it? Is it irrelevant or is there any background? We, we would say that there are controversies and conflicts. So how should I see this? How, what kind of an impact, impact could this have? What could it mean for Europe? Will Europe be in trouble as a result of this? How can we see this? Well, that was a whole series of questions. Well, I would say that there are all sorts of different levels. We have systemic questions, competition between the major systems, trade policy, technological questions, financial questions, or financial policy. Now, you're saying that it's not all that common in the press, and China has ambitious growth plans. These plans have to be financed. They have a great need for funding. So China, if I can put it this way, we have a system there which is a relatively closed financial system. Of course, there is the import of capital to China and export from China, but most of the funding of activities there is via a traditional semi-state bank system with a shadow banking system as well. And that means that the risk for 
them. In other words, that things might slow down because there is no lubricant anymore, because the transformation is not working. Well, the risk there is quite large. If you take a look at international creditors, if they look at what's going on in China, they're at the top of the list, and it says real estate economy in China. This, If you observe this carefully, it's really something that's rather Otark, and this is different compared to other ge geographies worldwide. And another topic that's at the top of the list is the debt of the municipalities. That, too, is a difficult issue, the high indebtedness of these municipalities. And the question is, how much transparency is there with regard to this indebtedness? And thirdly, when we talk about the shadow banking system, it's a bit difficult to know what kind of relationships exist there. The data is not all that reliable. So the system itself, when it comes to funding this way up to the top, but if you take a look at this, it's rather antiquated. It's not transparent and probably all not that high performing. So if you take that into account, you'll see that China is very much interested in having international capital come into China, and they want international creditors, and they then are becoming very nervous if certain standards are not met. And last week, this was quite clear when the rules for certain online services were reinforced and the markets collapsed here. So I think if you're sovereign there, you have to be very careful in balancing things when it comes to not shocking all the international aspects, and then they would not be available. Secondly, I think as a government statement in China. They want prosperity for their people. You're talking about the aging. What about pensions in China? What kind of financial burdens will there be? How will they be funded? And how will the institutions manage all of this? And the last point should not be omitted either. And because of the surplus that is generated there, China is a large creditor worldwide. Think about the uh, promissory notes in the U.S., so, no, it's the other way around. Sorry about that. The U.S. is investing more equity and less debt, and China is investing more debt and less equity. So that means that there is a big interest there in having a certain amount of stability in the financial markets, because these are investments from China that are going to the Western world. So the interdependence here means that this system is something that needs to be dealt with cautiously, cautiously no, nothing radical, so that the financing can also be insured in the future. Things can change, of course, with convertibility of the currency or reserve currency, the MIMBY, and this, I think, is something that is a long way to come. It's still just developing. Developments have taught us that China learns very quickly. They can also purchase innovations and adapt them. And we can also see this in the financial sector. And this is very active there as well. You can see that they are revising their own rules and regulations to get some opening. So I think that we are somewhat behind as opposed to other areas that we've been observing. Now, the question on Europe, very briefly, it was said, let me say, I apologize for making this a, this is a buzzword fit for purpose. And when we talk about threats, what are we countering this all with? And this was mentioned a couple of times already. So if the German sector has a problem, or the French, or the Luxembourgs, it becomes difficult. So this is an idea we can talk about in European institutions that can be reinforced, as opposed to a focused trading partner. And then you can say, pick your spots. Why? Because not everything is just one problem. We have areas that we can cooperate very well with China. Climate change, for example, that's a point that we will have to work together on. We also have special services and 
goods that China needs to build up their markets. We can see that in bilateral discussions. They're very flexible there. Then all of a sudden you get a 100% subsidiary. It's no longer a joint venture. Why? China is adaptable. And then finally, with regard to Europe diversification, we also have to think about where our markets are going to be in the future if we have more problems with China. You can think about more Europe. There's There are a lot of trade barriers bilaterally in Europe when it comes to different services. And what about the whole question of South America, also China's neighbors? And we can see that there are a number of initiatives where we say we have to strengthen Europe in order to come up with a counterweight. Well, I see a number of questions that I would like to ask, but we're running out of time. Maybe we have time for one more round of questions. Mr. Wittig, of course, I'm concerned about the Taiwan conflict and that this could mean that Europe might be pulled into a military conflict. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine that Europe will simply continue or... Would this automatically include Europe? Well, I think you can sleep well at night for quite some time to come. We don't have a war coming immediately or any explosive conflicts out on the horizon. But let me put it again. Let me say it again. The future is open. People who are experts on China say that this authoritarian course taken by President Xi, it might not survive for 20 years. President Xi decided to remain president for the rest of his life. And a lot of China experts say that this might be his major challenge because in terms of domestic policy, this results in opponents who might pull him out of office. So this authoritarian change is something which could become fragile and vulnerable. So there are opportunities out there so that perhaps maybe we will arrive at a turning point so that China would then cooperate more. And this is something which could also apply to the United States as well. That means that they will take on a larger position. Right now they are very tough in their attitude towards China and also the Congress in the United States, where they had a speech, if they speech against, speak out against them, they get a great round of, of applause. So I think I don't want to say that I have a crystal ball in front of me. Certainly not. Monica, another question for you. China defines 10 core areas where they want to be world leader. I'm in Germany, so of course I'm very interested in this, but what would be the German reply to that? Should we try to work on all of these core competencies or at a European level? What would the European reply be? Should we counter them in all 10 areas or should we focus on individual ones more and then say it would suffice if I have 10 patents and at least one of them belongs to me, then I can really threaten them. What would be the best strategy, broader or deeper, if you cannot be there in all at all levels? Well, I think our negotiating potential must be strengthened. We talked about whether we're too dependent on certain regions, in particular China, when we're talking about the supply or inputs or chips or whatever. How do we need to position ourselves better? And in this case, it's not that we need to do everything ourselves. We can't do everything ourselves. We simply can't do everything ourselves, but we have to see to it that what 
those who want it, they also have to get something from us. They need to want something from us. We have to make use of a skill for negotiating tactics. We have to see to it that in some areas we remain very, very good or even better than we are today. Our domestic market should be used even more, and we have to set the standards. Why is size so important for them? Why is it such a decisive advantage? Because they can use the standards very quickly. We need to be much stronger here in Europe and focus on the domestic market and see to it that we use this as our advantage. And bargaining chips need to be generated. And this can also be used in the negotiating situation. Gabriel, a question for you. Trade agreements. We have a certain amount of exclusivity. We can also obtain exclusivity here. So the question here, access and overlapping and one free trade zone, can they cooperate with another one or do they collide with another one? That's an option. What should Europe do if one of the two uh, really puts you under pressure? If the Americans say with us, but only with us, or if the Chinese take on the same strategy, that is a potential threat scenario, isn't it? This would be a nightmare for the European economy, and we need to avoid that with everything we can. It's trying, it's like a question of avoiding the plague or cholera. I think you have to do everything that we can so that this does not happen. And we're not in a very bad situation. Mr. Fuss showed us quite a good picture. It's comforting. And we can't see that Europe is in such a bad condition. No, fit for purpose. Domestic market, it's all been said already. Everything that we need. So the question is, how are we going to make progress there? I think that is the difficult question. Okay, it would be good if we develop here. And if you say, okay, how much do you need? Ten billion or whatever. And then you can develop something. Fine. But I don't think that's going to work. And I think if you take the momentum in the market, and how can you then see to it that you come up with the conditions you need? That is the central issue. So we need to discuss this intensely here in Europe. We have to liberate ourselves from former stereotypes, French industrial policy, whatever, to Germanize all of this. That would not be a good strategy. Those are the major challenges we're faced with. But our target is very clear. The selection between the two evils is something that shouldn't be allowed to happen. And a final question before we turn to the discussion, if that's okay with you, or should we go directly to the discussion? I have a question, but I can ask that later, perhaps.